please welcome Rod Blackhurst and Brian McGinn, the directors of Amanda Knox. <laughs> Brian Oakes, the director of Jim, the James Foley story. And Randy Barbato, Fenton Bailey of Maplethorpe, look at the pictures. And finally, uh, Barbara Koppel, a Lifetime Achievement winner at Doc NYC last year for her film, Miss Sharon Jones. Uh, so uh, the way we're gonna do this, like we did in our last panel, so I'm gonna start out going film by film and talking a little bit to each uh, filmmaking team and, and uh, teasing um, a trailer of their work so you can get a little taste of it. Um, let's uh, start with uh, Rod Blackhurst and Brian McGinn, and to get into this, we're gonna watch the trailer from Amanda Knox. If I'm guilty, it means that I am the ultimate figure to fear, because I'm not the obvious one. The girl known as Foxy Knox. Everyone is talking about it. I mean, it was a feeding frenzy for everyone. What more do you want in a story? I mean, all you're missing is the royal family and the Pope. I knew her only for five days. Perché la ragazza è stata coperta? All'uomo a uno sconosciuto non verrebbe in mente questa cosa. Did you kill her? How did things get to this point? Amanda Knox. If I'm innocent, it means that everyone's vulnerable, and that's everyone's nightmare. Either I'm a psychopath in sheep's clothing, or I am you. So one of the things that we're gonna be talking about on today's panel is each of these characters in, in each of these films are uh, complex characters, uh, characters that uh, you could have different shades of, uh, of opinion about, but uh, maybe none of them are uh, quite so uh, divisive as, uh, as Amanda Knox is in, um, in the way people perceive her and the way uh, public opinion has, uh, has, has formed over her. Uh, Rod and Brian, I wonder, let's start with you, Rod, um, how, uh, how you approached Amanda Knox as a character and navigated um, your relationship with her. I mean, it, it's obviously important that you win over her trust to get her to participate in this film that's a, that is the crux uh, of this film, and yet you, uh, I presume, wanted to um, uh, maintain a, uh, a certain kind of critical distance. Yeah, I think the way we approached her was the, the exact opposite way that anybody else had approached her, and that was largely news organizations at the time that were looking for interviews or you know exclusive interviews that they could kind of turn around and truncate into headlines. Um, and we told her the type of film that we wanted to make at first, and she declined to participate. And unlike the news, we said, okay, well that's fine. Whenever you'd like to talk to us, uh, we'll be ready to listen. Um, and I think we, we offered the same proposition to Giuliano Manini, the prosecutor, as well. And um, it took him several more years, um, two years after we did the first interview with Amanda for Giuliano Manini to uh, decide that he wanted to be heard. I think in our, uh, our offering to them, we acknowledged that they had become characters to everybody else. They'd sort of been reduced to these uh, you know, characters in this Hitchcockian drama or nightmare. And we wanted to actually understand who they were, regardless of who anybody wanted to believe legally or you know, factually. Um, and we, we offered them both that, and they said, well, we'd, we'd like to talk to you. We'd like to tell you who we are as people, not just the sort of the headline version that we became. Um, uh, Brian, it, it, with any of these characters, did you uh, feel like they were uh, you know, uh, uh, looking to engage in a dialogue or, or get you to, um, to uh, to convey their point of view over other people's points of view, because uh, you know. Well, of course. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that uh, you know, there's a motive for everyone in participating in a documentary, um, and I think the interesting thing for us was the order in which people kind of chose to participate in the film had everything to do with how the legal proceedings were going. 
So Amanda declined to do the film when she had just been acquitted in kind of her first appeals trial. And then she came back to us when she was facing a, a, another conviction in her second appeals trial. And so there was something on the line for her. And then Manini came to us when uh, the final verdict had acquitted Knox and Celeshto. And so you know, at, at every juncture, there was kind of a real impetus for people to talk. And I think that you know, one of the things that's our job is to, uh, to listen and not, you know, we didn't really sit there and uh, antagonize them. We really wanted to hear their points of view. And I think what's in the film, uh, you know, is really a reflection of their personality and, and, you know, the argument that they want to make for themselves at this moment in time. And, you know, they reveal their flaws uh, in doing so. You know, I think no one in the film is, is the best advocate for their own case, which is a really interesting component to this whole story. All right, let's move on to uh, Brian Oakes in the film, uh, Jim, the James Foley story. Uh, the next two films we're talking about are films of, uh, of deceased uh, subjects. And Brian, in your case, you came at this as having been a friend of James uh, Foley. Let's look at the trailer for Jim, the James Foley story. I believe frontline journalism is important. Without these photos and videos and first-hand experience, we can't really tell the world how bad it might be. It's the event with the second most recognition in recent American history after 9-11. Jim would have been horrified by that. I think I was in denial about how dangerous this really was. These four guys with guns, they stop the taxi and they put Jim into the back of their van. I didn't know if I was gonna see him again. We didn't know who was holding him. I was frantic. ISIS was on nobody's radar. They threatened to kill Jim. I hadn't heard Jim's voice in two years. I never, ever imagined that it would end in that fashion. We lost all hope and captivity. But James didn't. He saw the light instead of the dark. There's physical courage, but that's nothing compared to moral courage. If I don't have that moral courage, we don't have journalism. So, uh, Brian, in the case of uh, J James Foley, who, uh, as we see from there, was, was killed by ISIS, one of the early um, uh, uh, deaths of, uh, of uh, an American by ISIS. Uh, and one of the, the, the themes of this film is about journalists taking risks, uh, you know, getting uh, you know, too close to, uh, to danger. This was not the first time that, uh, that James Foley had put himself in a precarious situation, um, and so it, you know, while the film is a uh, is a real tribute to your friend, you're also going to you're also exploring some of the kind of critical sides of uh, of those questions. Can you talk about you know the way you struck that balance or approach that need to to talk about that critical side? Sure, um, you know, I think my original intention of of taking on this film was, like you say, Tom, I, I've known Jim since we were seven years old, so my character study of Jim has been a, <laughs> a lifetime. Um, but, you know, he, uh, in the, the intention was to really um, reclaim that image of Jim as everybody kind of got to know him. He was this, you know, American journalist in an orange jumpsuit, and it was kind of ISIS's, you know, awakening and announcement to the world that they, that they exist. Um, so it was a very surreal and and uh, and terrible and, and powerful um, experience to go through, um, and you know so the ultimate goal was to kind of reclaim that reclaim that image, recontextualize it, and, and and let people know who this journalist was and the and the, the amazing things he was doing in Syria. Um, but at the same time, um, I think the thesis of the film essentially came why. Ultimately, why did Jim go back to Syria? He had been captured in Libya a couple years before under the Gaddafi regime, um, and he chose to go back to the conflict zones. Um, and why do, j in turn, journalists, why, why, are, why do they continue to put themselves, their lives in danger in these, in these brutal, brutal, dangerous um, regions of the world? And, and I wanted to explore that question because I had that question for, for Jim. It's like, why do you keep going back there? I think, um, you know, and I think there was public, you know, some public backlash. It was like, well, 
yeah, I mean, he got killed because he was over there. What was he doing over there? And so that's a very important question because uh, modern freelance journalism right now, and freelance is a key, key word for journalists because a lot of the media bureaus as they're closing down are relying on freelance journalists to bring them stories from these areas. And you know they go in there with ne not necessarily the right uh, preparation or the insurance and you know low wages. So it's a very different landscape for journalists right now. And, um, and so yeah, the, 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 the thesis ultimately was exploring that and through um, colleagues of Jim's, there was uh, four journalists that he, he worked with um, two of which who were captured with him in Libya, um, we really got the sense of um, answering that question of of why these guys decide to go back. And a lot of it is, is you know, it's important to them, obviously. Um, we as a civilization need to know what's going on in these conflict zones to, to move forward. I mean, we have images of World War II. We have, we have film from Vietnam. Like, this is very important documentation. So there's a real um, effort amongst these journalists and they feel that's very important. It's also, they kind of have this uh, soldier mentality as well where you go in and they're witnessing horrific things, children being bombed and, and people getting killed. And, and when you leave that environment and you come back to the real world of you know, where it's safe places, it, it's a very difficult adjustment to make. So there's a lot of post-traumatic stress and, and this world becomes like very real and there's like this, you know, Jim describes it as this siren song. They kind of get drawn back into these conflict zones. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of kind of layers to, um, to, 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 that, to that question, but that's ultimately what I was trying to explore with Jim. Uh, let's turn to Randy Barbato and uh, Fenton Bailey. It occurs to me now that uh, of, of all the films we're talking about, uh, you were th you're the ones here who didn't know your subject uh, personally um, in making this film, Maplethorpe, uh, look at the pictures. Before I ask you a question, let's look at the trailer of Maplethorpe, look at the pictures. Robert Maplethorpe, who spent the last years of his life promoting homosexuality. Now, any senator who thinks that I'm attacking aesthetic art, if they have any doubt, and look at the pictures, look at the pictures, look at the pictures. He loved to get a jolt out of people, a reaction. It was power. Just the way he dressed, the way he carried himself. The artist encompassed him. I always was fascinated with the idea of taking sexuality and bringing it to a level that it hadn't been to before. There was tension. My father wouldn't look at Robert. He was really not part of the family. He was so busy being Robert Maplethorpe to really care. Everything was the means to an end to his career. He was a new type of art. The whole point of being an artist is to learn about yourself. The photographs, I think, are less important than the life that one is leading. So, Randy, let me uh, start with you. What was your process of getting to figure out who Robert Maplethorpe was through d doing these interviews with people who knew him since you didn't know him yourself? Um, well, to begin with, I mean, I, I think we were drawn to him because I, I think because of this sort of NEA uh, um, scandal, he was largely defined by that. And so we, like many people, didn't really Which know. Where, just to put in context, Jesse Helms, who we see there saying, look at the pictures, this actually occurred uh, within months after Robert Maplethorpe had died. There was going to be an exhibit of his work in Washington, uh, D.C. that had some uh, 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 government money behind the, uh, the institution, and Jesse Helms went after it for, for that. Yeah, and it was sort of the tipping point of the culture wars as we know them now, and he was very much demonized. And so for us, the beginning of the process was really to look at his work. Like, he, he, he was defined by such few pieces of work, and yet he was incredibly prophetic. I mean, he only, he died at the age of 42, and yet he produced so much work, so little of which any of us were familiar with. So Fenton and I really became sort of, just spent a lot of time connecting with the art, and then 
digging up as much uh, uh, tape, audio of him, so listening to him. It was sort of in that order. It was looking at the work, listening to him, and then sort of connecting with as many, I mean, I think we, we probably interviewed on tape maybe uh, um, 75 people, and, but there were over between 100 and 200 people that we actually talked to. So, you know, there was close to a year of just doing that before we really even filmed anything. Fenton, watching the film, you get the sense that there, there are, that there's definitely a spiky side to Maplethorpe's personality. If, you know, if you wanted to make a film saying Robert Maplethorpe was an asshole, you could probably cherry pick uh, uh, you'd, uh, you'd have plenty of information to cherry pick from to make that film. And if you wanted to make a film that said Robert Maplethorpe was a groundbreaking uh, artist, uh, hero of uh, free expression, uh, you could make that film. And, and I think the film that, uh, that you guys made is a more nuanced version that, that has all of that uh, in it. And I wonder if you could talk about the process of, of finding that. Well, I think um, he was both of those things and, and embodied both extremes, as I think all of us actually do. You know, I can be an asshole, <laughs> and I can be nice sometimes, too. <laughs> but I think it was that singular image. This was, this was I, I think what we came to discover was how prescient Maplethorpe was. Knowing that he was going to die, he really wanted to make sure that he could transcend his own death and leave behind something that people would remember him by. And, and so what's so interesting is that he, his last exhibition, he for the first time put together in the same cabinet the sex pictures and the flower pictures together. So you could see them, and, and that he knew would be explosive. He'd always kept them separate because people who want to see sex pictures would go see sex pictures. People who want to see flower, you know, that he recognized that there was a sort of polite distinction between art and erotic uh, material, and he sort of knew to keep them separate. So he left this sort of time bomb behind. And then I think 25 years after all that fuss had died down, we could really go back and examine and present the true complexity of the person. And I think that's surely the whole point of documentary filmmaking, is that you can really present people as they really are, and people really are, it's a combination of, of good and bad. Except Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, Barbara, uh, let me turn to you and your film, uh, Miss Sharon Jones. Uh, this film follows the singer Sharon Jones as she undergoes uh, a year of battling cancer, builds up to a, uh, a comeback show at, the, at New York's Beacon Theater. Before I ask you a question, uh, let's sh uh, show a trailer from Miss Sharon Jones. Give a huge welcome to Sharon Jones and the Dap King. Yeah. Hit it. Woo! Sharon's voice is like a train. You better get out the way. People have called Sharon Jones a female James Brown. In the 1980s, Sharon Jones was working in a series of jobs that included a corrections officer. Correction officer at Rikers. She doesn't have a radio hit, but she has a huge audience all over the world. Please welcome back Sharon Jones and the Death Kings. Nineteen years, we've been constantly going. I remember that first winter. There was no heat. Sharon and I did all the electricity. It was tough. They said I was too fat, too black, too short, and too old. And look at me now. All this hard work is finally paying off. Something was clearly wrong. Her eyes were yellow. She was losing weight, and the doctor said, it's cancer. She might not come back. We were freaked out, you know? This is my sister. She can be real tough. This isn't the end of her career. This is the middle. Go on, Sharon. You know this is what you do. Get on out there and sing. But I told myself, God bless you with a gift. Use your gift. 
I have no eyebrows, but I'll be looking cute. <laughs> I feel my day is coming. We're gonna sell a million records. The show must go on. Barbara, if I'm not mistaken, I think the first day that you met Sharon Jones and started filming her with her is the moment you see uh, captured in the trailer where she's getting her head shaved to prepare for uh, chemotherapy. Um, can you talk about how you bonded with Sharon Jones? Uh, well, I'd be delighted to. Uh, so VH1, um, Alex, who is uh, Sharon Jones's manager, thought, Okay, maybe people know one or two of her songs, A Hundred Days, A Hundred Nights. I think it's time that a film was made. And they went to two really great guys who were then at VH1, which is Steve Mintz and uh, Brad Abramson, and pitched the story. And Brad and Steve said, oh, we have just the person for you. <laughs> and lucky beyond my wildest dreams, that was me. I had done a film called Woodstock Now and Then for VH1. And so, you know, everybody was talking about it. And then a few days later, a week later, uh, Alex, the manager, who plays an amazing role in this film as, you know, almost her father, he has her back, he's her manager, he just adores her and goes through things with her every step of the way called me up and he said, Barbara, I know that we don't have any agreements, we don't have anything, and I shouldn't admit this, but those things don't mean anything to me, really. I mean, what means something to me is going out there and being with the people and filming. And so I went up to Albany, which is where she was having her dreads, you know, cut off and her head shaved and really a very big transition that all cancer patients go through. And she was crying and, you know, but she did fit in. If you want to know who I am, Google me, SharonJones.com. <laughs> and so I knew she had a sense of humor. And on that first day, too, we also went to a place that you try on wigs. And so she was, like, performing. She put on a wig, no, I wouldn't wear this, or... You know, I look like Whoopi Goldberg or, you know, whatever. So she decided not to do that. But I just knew that I had this absolutely down-to-earth person that I was filming who would give everything. And it's not like she, like, loved me all the time because she'd hear I was coming and not to my face, and she'd sort of roll her eyes like them again. And, but... Once we were there, she couldn't have been greater. She was so happy. She fights everybody coming to see her, and once they come to see her, she is just beyond graciousness and happiness. So uh, this audience is full of filmmakers and some aspiring filmmakers. Uh, in most of these films, uh, interviews are so key and, and teasing out emotional interviews and teasing out... Um, uh, you know, questions of complexity in characters. I'd love to, you know, to, uh, to get some lessons that you've learned um, in the course of, of doing this uh, about that uh, technique. So uh, Rod and Brian, uh, you, know, uh, you did several interviews with, uh, with Amanda Knox. And the others. Uh, and, and the others. Um, can you talk about how you like, worked your way up to asking the hardest questions? Yeah, uh, I, I don't think that we ever approached it in a combative manner. So it was never, uh, there's never a list of, oh, these are the four questions that we're building towards. All the interviews were conversations, and all the interviews were really driven by the subject. So we knew we were covering eight years, um, but we wanted everyone to drive the conversation because we discovered a lot of things by listening and by encouraging them to reveal themselves to us. And so, you know, I think that was the most important part of the interviews was had we gone in saying that we're building to these four questions, 
we're no different than Diane Sawyer or Chris Cuomo, who you see in the main title sequence of our film, who are, you know, approaching it from a 60 minutes style, a, a gotcha, you know, looking for one or two pull quotes that they can pop on the evening news. And that was never really our, I don't think that's how you build character portraits, that's how you do the news. And so I think that for us, just the listening and encouragement, I think that, you know, my face while interviewing is just like a constant smile and nod and sh completely <laughs> shutting up and letting them talk, so. I think too, to add to what Barbara was saying about Sharon is that they were all hesitant every time we called and every time we said, we'd like to come film with you, we'd like to do another interview, we'd like to come Except shoot Except Nick Pisa, the journalist. He was very excited to come to us, that's true. But they, you know, we went to Italy several times and Giuliano Manini would say, I, I can't do it now. And he said, well, we've come all the way to Italy, we've, we've driven a truck full of grip and electric gear, what? Um, and I think that, you know, from, from that, you know, we were able to, by taking our time and never being uh, pushy, and then letting them decide when they were ready again. We did, you know, maybe three interviews with Amanda. Um, there were the first one was two, one maybe three full days of interviews with her. Giuliana Manini was four full days, two separate occasions. So you know, it really was a, a long game, not a, not a uh, a Chris Cuomo situation. And, and the questions we were asking, I think I remember people always ask about the opening quote in the film, which is in the trailer, the "If I'm innocent, if I'm guilty," line that Amanda says. And that came from just asking her why people had been so interested in this case, which if you think about it, no one had asked her, which is insane, because she'd been thinking about it every single day for eight years, I'm sure, and yet those were not the question, because everyone was so fascinated by the guilt or innocence question, no one was trying to push past that element. And so we actually found that there, people had spent a lot of time kind of in their own heads, and I think I would imagine that that was the same for for you guys, that that you know, how how does how does Sharon process that uh, diagnosis? How do, how do how does Jim's family get through those things? I would imagine there were things that they had not talked a lot publicly about, right? Well, Brian, let me uh, ask you about that. Now, am I right? Uh, Jim is your first film. Uh, uh, you have a background. You've been in the documentary space for a long time. Doing graphics is uh, is your specialty uh, for films. Um, Obviously, you wanted to take this on because James Foley uh, was your friend. What did you learn as a first-time filmmaker sitting down with James's family and friends and having to, um, you know, uh, uh, dredge up some emotional uh, subjects? Yeah. Well, I had, my, I had an interesting... I kind of had two categories of, of people in my film. I had Jim's family, who I've known for my entire life, and it was his parents and four siblings. Um, I had his colleagues who, for all intents and purposes, I, I knew because they were friends. And then I had a second group who were the former hostages that Jim was held with in Syria. So, um, you know, I, being a first time filmmaker and, and not doing, I've never done like long form interviews, you know, my approach was just very conversational. I, I you know, I, one of my heroes is Mr. Herzog and so I, I kind of l listened. Did you do to them all in a German accent? <laughs> <laughs> Please, that would have been interesting. But one of the, one of the really interesting things that he said when I, I can't remember what it was one of his lectures is the is the importance of creating empathy with your characters and how do you do that? And one of the things that he talks about is creating the space, um, the kind of the nonverbal <laughs> space when you're talking with someone. So if we're having a conversation, and as an interviewer, as Brian says, you, you don't say anything, you kind of, you don't want to ruin the sound bite, so you're silent, and you're kind of nodding. But when someone is finished talking, you can kind of let that empty space happen. And that's a very interesting moment because what happens is what I found is that it's, it's, it's awkward in a way because it's silence. Um, and so awkwardness of visual, seeing someone in that silence creates this really interesting empathy for that person. But at the same time, it allows them to process what they just said. And during that time of their process, they might think of s something else to say, which they've never even thought about before. And you find some really amazing um, moments that, that are 
really impactful making the film and just being in that moment with that person. And it sometimes that translates really powerfully into into the interview as well. So I think kind of creating that creating empathy was always something that I was kind of looking to do and, and, and ultimately just letting people talk. I mean it, it does become like they th these these are some things that they they're they've thought about in their own head for a long time, but the first time they start talking about it, I mean, if you've ever been to therapy, it's kind of very similar. You just like start talking, it's like, oh, you know, all this stuff kind of comes out. So, um, and as far as like, you know, so there was that kind of, that was what I was thinking about. And as far as a visual, I have, I have a graphics background, so I'm always thinking of the visual as well. And, and my, my approach, you know, I, I actually shot all of my, um, the family, the colleagues, um, everybody in Jim's life before he was captured on a, with a wide angle, a little bit further back. So you kind of see this space, it's very kind of light and homes and you know cafes. Um, so there's a little bit of distance with you. And then when Jim gets captured and he goes into captivity and I decided to shoot my, um, the former hostages with a uh, tighter lens, much closer to camera so there's kind of this uh, and, and much darker, so you, there's kind of this almost claustrophobic, real intimacy there. So you, you kind of get a, maybe a subconscious transition from, you know, going into this space as well. So that's kind of how I approached. What was it? Uh, can I just ask a quick question? What was it? What was it like? The difference between interviewing your people that you knew and had emotional bonds with, knowing that you were sharing their story with people that didn't know all of the stuff that you knew about them. It seems like that creates a unique challenge that's different than interviewing people that you don't know already. Yeah, I mean, it, it, is, it is a challenge. And, um, you know, so, yeah, I mean, the, fa the, family, the family was interesting because I think the familiar, having the familiarity with them was made it easier for me because they knew I didn't have an agenda. I was there as a friend and wanting to tell an honest story. So that that space was was intimate and, and very um, comfortable. Um, and then interviewing the people that I didn't know, these former hostages, was really tricky, but at the same time, like I was going in expecting like horror stories, but it, what I came out with were these really amazing uh, stories of humanity and how they kind of formed a family in this in this captivity. And ultimately, you know, they knew Jim almost as well as, you know, I did because I mean, this is like two years in a in a room that's you know the size of the double this stage. So you get to know people <laughs> pretty well. So it was a, it was an interesting experience for sure. So uh, Randy and Fenton, if, if you interviewed seventy five people, I take it you did not have the luxury of doing three days of uh, full interviews like uh, like Rod and Brian talk about uh, for Amanda Knox and uh, some of their characters. I'm uh, you know I once. Uh, interviewed Errol Morris and Werner Herzog, and while we were doing the interview, Errol Morris said how he always knows if someone walks in with a piece of paper with their questions on it, that's gonna be a terrible interview, um, at which point I had to kind of uh -oh. throw away my uh, <laughs> uh, questions. Um, but, I, you know, but I always think about that. If you've got an hour to interview someone, uh, there's some questions you wanna get out, and I, and I do think that the, you know, it's a beautiful thing when you can just have a flowing conversation um, that just, uh, you know, ha happens spontaneously. But there's also some questions you gotta ask. Um, so I wonder what your technique is. Well, de definitely you don't have three days, which would, but that idea, you wanna, you wanna have that experience of three days in whatever time you have allotted. And often a subject will say, I'll give you half an hour. And we're like, okay, we'll take it. And just push it and push it and keep, keep going. Because the fact is, I think often the lights and the camera it is an unusual setup, uh, situation in which to have a conversation. It's so, it's the, the setup is quite intimidating and you wanna get past that to have that empathetic connection. And in terms of the questions on paper, what I do is we'll write them the night before and go through them and then leave the paper behind so that it's sort of hopefully all in your mind and you can just go with them and chat with them and just keep rolling there was one exception uh, with another f inside Deep Throat where Norman Naylor said he'd give us half an hour. And we had to go to Martha's Vineyard for half an hour. And at 29 minutes and 50 seconds, 
He said, I'm halfway through my sentence and your time is up. But since you asked such a good question, I will continue. <laughs> and then he got up and left. But I swear to you, half an hour, it was p everything he said was uh, brilliant. I, I would just add, with us, it's like a twofer. I mean, we, we have been making films together forever. So we definitely, like, we're both design queens. One of us is like figuring out the shot while the other one is like schmoozing the person. And we, we tag team it because there are different, there are different subjects who, who we connect with in different ways. And if one of us is doing the interview, the other one is there like, you know, off to the side, ready to step in at the end. So we're, so we're lucky like in that baseball way. baseball closer. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. like, um, and I was just going to mention something. And the, 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 the sort of negative space, I mean, there are some of our best interviews, we didn't, we asked like one question. I mean, one of our first films, The Eyes of Tammy Faye, the very first time we shot with her, we didn't even have a deal or anything. Like, we went up, and I was like, oh, let's just bring the camera just in, ca just in case. And we said, do you mind if we just, it was about, about 120 degrees in Palm Springs. And we said, can we just, you know, shoot one thing? And she said, sure, let's do it outside. We were in an air-conditioned thing. We went outside, uh, held the camera, and she spoke for like an hour and a half. Like, we didn't even ask her a question. And huge chunks of that ended up in that final film. Her makeup. Her, no, <laughs> it's tattoo. Her makeup did not run. No. Randy and I were just sweating <laughs> so much. Yeah, I right. thought I was going to pass out. Yeah. <laughs> But she was cool as a cucumber. Yeah, it's a great film. Um, the Barbara, in uh, in your films like Miss Sharon Jones or the Dixie Chicks film that uh, I love so much, um, I actually don't think of interviews ha uh, happening. Although there are, you know, there are sometimes where characters are talking uh, to screen. It's but it, it feels more like just a flow of you're experiencing something uh, as it's uh, as it's going on. And, um, I, and, and in each of these films, uh, you're following stories, you're often following stories that you don't kind of know where the end is when, when you've started it. And in Miss Sharon Jones, you're following her through this chemo treatment. You don't know how that's going to uh, come out. Um, how, how do you ride that story? Uh, well, I do do some interviews um, just to have them in case. I need them, but they're not sort of the mainstay. But they do pop up at very important times. Uh, and I'm curious, do you, how do you pick and choose your interview moments? Is it like, do you think today we're going to sit down and do an interview with Alex, or is it more you're filming with him and ask him a few questions? Uh, it depends. There's, there's never really an agenda. I sort of let the characters take me where they're going to take me. And with Sharon Jones, Jer Sharon Jones is such a life force. She's so amazing. I never thought for a minute that she wasn't going to make it. Everything about her just, you know, reams sunshine and reams strength. Uh, she would go in and she would have chemo and people would be sitting there, you know, very depressed and very unhappy. And she just start talking to them and they brighten up and she'd you know show them her her newest video or she'd sing a little to them and she just made that room into a room of hope and she was everybody loved her um, and everybody couldn't wait until she came in she's also the kind of person that um, wants you to know everything I mean she says well, I want my fans to know exactly what I'm thinking. <laughs> That's and a great documentary <laughs> character. <laughs> yeah. And I just want people to know. So I'm not going to hide anything from anybody. And she didn't. She was just open and a wonderful. A little bit to the nervousness of her management, I think, sometimes. No. They were great. They were totally hands off. I mean, I, I wanted them to come in, you know, because sometimes I need a little pat on the head like you're doing okay. <laughs> and um, so Alex and Austin, who was her assistant manager, were in our area and they said, well, can we stop by? And I said, yes, yes, please do. 
And so I brought them into the editing room and I said, well, would you like to see a few scenes? And we showed them one or two scenes and they liked them and I said, well, do you want to stay and see more? <laughs> and they said, no, we have <laughs> meetings to go to. <laughs> but that was the amount of time that they looked at it. I mean, I think that Sharon really liked us um, and the band grew to love us and the management liked us and it's something they wanted to do. And when you have somebody who wants to do something, you're sort of allowed a lot of access, you know. So it was, it was a wonderful experience. The Dap Kings and Sharon and the management are all close friends of mine. I mean, most of the film characters that I do, I stay very much in touch with. Um, I always watch my films whenever they're showing. Last night it showed at Cooperstown, which was the place that had given her her chemo and everybody knew her and it was a really extraordinary screening. And a lot of the people in the film were there, like Gabe Ross, who's, you know, Dap Kings and, um, Austin Holman, the assistant manager, and Megan Holcomb, who was who taught her how to drink green drinks, even though she'd sneak hams into the refrigerator and pork and whatever she wanted. But people love her, and when she feels she's loved, there's nothing she can't do. So, as uh, my last round of questions, uh, th this is a we're living in a historic moment uh, this week, and in the last uh, 48 hours that I've been um, talking to filmmakers uh, here at the festival. Uh, there's a lot of conversations about, you know, what does this moment mean for uh, documentary filmmaking? And I know that it's still uh, fresh in, on everyone's minds, but I wonder how each of you have been thinking about uh, this moment and, and if, you, if it's caused you to think differently about uh, you know, what you're going to be doing uh, going forward in, in documentary filmmaking. So uh, I know, I realize it's a big and kind of open-ended question, but I'm just curious to, to gather thoughts. Uh, uh, Rob? Climate change docs, climate change docs. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think in our film, we, you know, there's a clear examination of the, the shift in the journalism landscape to become uh, commodified entertainment that is you know, designed to appeal to people's emotions and is not fact-based or and not even, you know, coming close to talking about the facts. And I think that, you know, we, we hope that when people watch our film, at least they see the way that that happens and not just as it relates to true crime stories, but of course to presidential elections when we're talking about who, how many times someone is coughing or whether they need a pillow or where Obama was born when those things really don't have any impact on policy or information getting to a voter. You know, when our mainstream media is having those conversations, you know, we're, uh, we're, we've moved kind of far away from what we should be talking about. I think we have a responsibility to figure out how to reach everyone. I think that as documentary filmmakers, a lot of the time we're preaching to the choir, people that already believe the things that we believe. And I think that the big responsibility right now in this moment is to figure out how we can reach the people that you know, dismiss uh, documentaries as partisan pieces of work. And so I think that's the big challenge. I don't feel like I have a really good answer for it, but that's the thing that I'm trying to think about. Yeah, I mean, um, Tom and this Doc NYC, which is an amazing, amazing festival, you know, you had the um, lunch uh, the other day. And being a first time filmmaker and being in a room with people like Michael Moore and all these like amazing experienced filmmakers um it was it was it was actually really great because the, it was the talk of everyone's um kind of speeches and and it was on the minds of everybody but there was this real um community feeling and a real responsibility and, and actually it was i think it was alex gibney made a joke about we shouldn't all be gathered here together because if we get hit by a drone strike you know there's a lot of uh, powerful people that it will be eliminated, so. He said, next time we organize something like this, it better not by, be by email. We should just pass notes to yeah. <laughs> Smoke <laughs> signal. So I think um, as this documentary community is around us, I think we are, we are a very powerful group of, of, of people, and that's exciting. That's kind of a nice, I think, a really uh, refreshing thing to kind of think about, and, and hopefully we can take on the responsibility of uh, 
you know, making honest films and, and I agree, like reaching a demographic that that needs to, that we wouldn't necessarily think that we would be um, making films for, so, man. You know, Brian, your first re response was, you know, climate change docs and, and we could probably tick off several other issues that we uh, feel like we'd want to um, be engaging with uh, uh, more. And, uh, but it also strikes me that, you know, sometimes when you, you know, rush at an issue um, as a storyteller that it doesn't always make for great storytelling. It, you know, there's a, uh, there's a will to lecture and that doesn't make for uh, such a, a satisfying film. And Randy and Fenton makes me, you know, think of your work. You, you've made lots of films about different kinds of uh, outsiders um, and even Robert Maplethorpe. It's not uh, necessarily a, um, uh, a, an overtly political film, but of course, politics are, uh, are a part of it. Um, and, and I'd love to hear you know, what your thinking is about you know, engaging politics directly or embedding it in, in other kinds of work. Well, I, I think the, the personal is political. And uh, I think Tammy Faye, for example, was a very powerful figure. And I think Maplethorpe was a very powerful figure. And I think that you're absolutely right when you were saying earlier about the sort of the fact-based arguing of the issues has either slipped past regular media from a, a news point of view, or we end up just talking in, a, in an echo chamber. And uh, I think you just, Trump ha created a story and it was all personality-based and this sort of feeling. It wasn't anything to do with facts. I mean, most of it is lies. I mean, shocking. But it made me think, like, you look at a film like series, a film, I don't know, O.J. Made in America, you need 10 hours to unpack the personality of O.J., but then also all the stuff that was going on, all the police brutality, all the racism issues, so that you can lay it all out. And, and, and then I think you can really make something that really impacts people. And, um, but some, yeah. I mean, we talked about making a Trump film. Yes, well, let me ask you about that, because uh, when I interviewed you for my podcast, uh, Pure Nonfiction, uh, in April, uh, I, it was a few weeks earlier, I'd been with you at the Miami Film Festival in March, and, uh, and you told me uh, yes. our next film is going to be about but Trump. And we just thought it was like, court like we, we just thought it would be bad, like, karma. Like, back then, when we started thinking about it and we really like we started doing it and then we just thought this is like what was the focus of it it was his it was just all him it was just going to be him all his words it was going to it was going to be him, you know you've seen little bits of it in news in some sort of alternative news but we were going to try and do the whole the like the list, like listen to me marlin but yeah, with yeah, Donald yeah. Trump oh, just uh -huh. repeating himself ad nauseum. Uh -huh. But maybe not as beautiful as that. Um, <laughs> yeah, not as eloquent. <laughs> but, yeah. But it just, it felt, it felt, um, it just felt like, and also back then, it, we really kept hoping that what happened wouldn't happen. Like, it just seemed like that, it, it seemed like the impossible. I think for us, I mean, I think we've, al we've always felt like outsiders. We've always connected with outsiders. We've always made work that nobody's really considered political except for us. And I think that we just have to double down on it and just keep doing that. Because I think when you make stuff that people connect with, and if it, it and I, I think the point about trying to make your work as broad as possible is really important to everybody here. Because not because we're all sort of, we want, you know, we're sort of, um, pop whores or something like that. I mean, I think it's just because, because if you have something to say, you know, you, you want as many people as possible to hear it. Broad so doesn't mean simplistic at yeah, all. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. I mean, maybe th my well, question is, yeah. well, to add to what you're saying and what Brian and Brian have said is, how do you get those, uh, those examinations out of that echo chamber to reach the people that are already gonna write it off because they're, uh, you know, someone looks at Maplethorpe and says, well, I, I don't like that person because of X, and I'm just gonna not, I'm just gonna disregard it. Or with an examination of Donald Trump, wh whatever it might be, how do we reach the people that 
we aren't reaching in a way that, uh, you know, kind of strips away the ideology or what they already firmly believe and can, I don't know, can connect with them. I think that's something, I don't know, I struggle the with. The personal, I, I thought that was really interesting, Fenton, what you said about the personal be, being political. I, th I think that Broadway, all your movies have that as well. They have like a real, in, embedded in that, in that personal story, there is a there is a real kind of larger issue at stake. I, I think that makes a lot of sense to me. So, uh, Barbara, what have you been thinking about this week as it applies to your filmmaking? Uh, I've been thinking about a lot of things, and I've been thinking that what I love to do is make films that take you around another corner, that you think you know who somebody is, but you don't and allow them the room and the space to be who they are. Um, I'm finishing a film now um, called Gigi Gorgeous. And <laughs> Which feels like a Fenton Randy film, <laughs> <laughs> but frankly, uh, the Gigi Gorgeous. It's, it's a wonderful, a I mean. Tell us what Gigi Gorgeous is about. Yeah, uh, it's a wonderful film, and it's about a young boy who grows up in Toronto, and he becomes a great diver, and he wins the nationals, and they want him to go to the Olympics, but something is wrong, and all he can think about is heels and lipstick. He's 14 years old, and this is probably around 2008, and then he decides that he's gonna go on YouTube, a friend tells him about it, and he starts to do makeup applications. He doesn't really know what he's doing, but I started practicing what he was doing, like hold your cheek in and <laughs> do this, because I don't know how to put on makeup. Um, and he did that for a while, and then his mother died, and she died of cancer, and he decided that life was too short to um, stay who he was, that he had always wanted to be a woman. And it's a story of, I guess, transition, not only transition for him, but also for his father, who's a very straight-laced businessman from Toronto. And the father had to step into the role of both mother and father. And you see him, you know, giving him sponge baths after, you know, different procedures. We go through some of the procedures. And now Gigi Gorgeous is this absolutely magnificent woman. And it's a story about love. And it's a story about acceptance. And even if we don't understand you know, what somebody does and we support it, it's a much healthier and we really learn so much for, from them. And so that's just a film I'm doing. But I also want to do you know, a film on people that you think are a certain way but really aren't and bring them into the forefront. And I don't want to go after a who got you. I've never been like that. I like people to open up, to feel comfortable, to bloom in, in who they are and what they are. Well, I hope you all get a chance to see all of uh, these films. Rod, do you, you have your microphone up? Um, uh, uh, they we're very happy to have them as part of the Doc NYC shortlist. Uh, we're going to take a lunch break, and Deborah will be back at 1 o'clock. Uh, 2 o'clock. Uh, uh, 2 o'clock. Uh, right. We'll be back at uh, 2 o'clock uh, with our next panel, so uh, please come back. Thank you to Rod Blackhurst, Brian McGinn, Brian Oaks, Randy Barbato, Fenton Bailey, and Barbara Koppel.